Hello and welcome back to the Nasty Metal production channel here with YouTube and welcome to uh, again more of the end of the year list and this is like I've stated in, in the end of my top 10 thrash metal albums of this year it's the top 10 rock releases of 2020 so without further ado let's get in to my top 10 Coming here at number 10 is Reimaginos from Albert Bouchard. This, of course, is his own take on the 1988 Bluerst Occult album Imaginos, uh, which, again, this was his idea in the first place. It was his concept, but, of course, uh, due to the original producers for Bluerst Occult being Sandy Perman and, uh, and Murray Krugman, he, they definitely wanted to then uh, bring in most of the original Bluerst Occult members to record it. And what was the result was more of a, a fairly heavy um, rock album. At times almost bordering on metal here and there. With the, Again, just an, and of course with all the big 80s production, it definitely just, it, it sounded more more like an 80s metal record. But again, with Bluerst Occult's charm and and style added to it. Well, what Albert Bouchard does on his version here is instead of being heavy, it's more relaxed. It sounds more calmer compared to the version that came out in 1988. And it's so different, especially when you hear some of these songs, especially, of course, we got another version of Astronomy and it's even more calmer, at times more folkier. It's just so different uh, compared to to the uh, the 1988 uh, version. It's just so different, and Albert Bouchard does it, and, and it's interesting. Uh, he definitely, again, he gives it his own unique flavor to it, and I, and again, it, it, in some ways, it works. Uh, though I don't know if, if this will be one that I'll always go back to. Uh, if the thing is, I'm so familiar with the uh, the Bluerst Cult version. Uh, uh, of this album, but again, I gotta give uh, Albert Bouchard a credit to where it's due. He took it into to, to a direction that he wanted it to be in the direction uh, this whole entire entire time. He he definitely took it a lot more different. He took it to a different direction, and that's the thing that, that I definitely dig. Again, uh, if you don't know, Albert Bouchard being one of the original members of Bluerst Cult, so. Uh, and of course, this will not, not be the only time I'll be talking about Bluerst Cold here on this top 10 list. But again, um, Reimaginals is an interesting one. If you're really interested in checking out uh, this one, if you were if if you were so familiar with the version from Bluerst Cold, I think you definitely should check this one out just for at least for curiosity's sake, because of you'll definitely be surprised by what he does with this album. So I don't want to try, try and talk too long about this one. It's better left uh, here, at least left uh, unsaid, and and in many ways. I mean, I, I briefly at least went into some details, but I think it's better for all of you to t take your yourselves a listen because you'll get a better idea of it. You'll, it's, again, I think uh, the suspense is better when, when everything is uh, at least uh, low-key sad, I guess. Uh, that, that's the best way. So uh, that's here at number 10. Coming at number 9 is Night Fighter, the second album from Australian hard rock band Catalano. Uh, again, Catalano, uh, are a, uh, their styling is very much almost in that sort of mid or late 80s period... I guess hair metal, glam metal uh, type of stuff, that kind of sound, but definitely taking a lot of influence from like uh, that period of Def Leppard, though without the overproducedness of Mutt Lang. But it still, it kind of has that, and again, I dig this. I think this is a much better album, like I, again, I've stated this in my review for this album. I, th I think this is a much better album than any of the recent Def Leppard albums. It sounds more like Def Leppard than Def Leppard these days. So, it, it's a good album. Uh, I don't mind it. I don't want to talk too much about it. Again, I've already done a review on this album. So, let's definitely move on to number 8. Because this is where I probably should at least save a little bit more opinions here for this one. And that's Woosh from Deep Purple. The... Was it at this point the fifth album? 
with uh, the this at least some of the lineup since uh, perpendicular that being um, Steve Morse and um, again the st uh, lineup of Steve Morse Ian Gillen and Ian Pace with of course uh, and um, Roger Glover. The only thing that the only musician that's missing from this album is John Lord, and he had had been with the band uh, not since 1999 or 2000, since uh, 1998's uh, abandoned. He hasn't been with the band since then, and of course, uh, this is at least one of the uh, the third album I believe since uh, the passing of John Lord. But uh, I, again, uh, who we got on board here uh, being Don Airy. And in my review, I've stated it. This is not a bad record at all. It's different. I mean, you're not ex you're, uh, the, the going to this album to think you're going to expect uh, at least in rock, Fireball, Machine Head, or even Burn or Stormbringer or even at times Come Taste the Band or Perfect Strangers. You're probably are going to get. Or you're, probably, you're probably gonna be very disappointed because again, it's calmer. I mean there this still is some rock and parts But it's just lighter weight compared to the heavyweight material of the past But that's not a way to really knock the album It's just it just means it just sounds different compared to at least the past one even compared to perpendicular All right, um, uh, I mean listening to, to this album it, this, this was uh, again. I don't think that this was a bad record. I think what was it I stated? This might be what the best sound maybe since uh, Perpendicular. I might have said I don't know, but it's kind of in that same vein. But even it's a little to me, even personally, I feel it's even more lighter weight. But there's still some heaviness. But it's mostly from, of course, Don Harry, who, of course, uh, he definitely. Due to, of course, Bob Erzman's production, which he had been producing since uh, 2013's Now What, uh, he definitely softens a lot of the band's uh, style. He really just softens up more of the uh, the musical uh, the leanings. And instead, uh, what he does really, he's, he really puts Don Airy really up front because of the keyboards really overpower a lot of the guitars on this album. I think that there's some great riffs here from Steve Morse, but it does tend to overpower it. And that's probably only really one of the biggest knocks I can give this album is the fact that how superly uh, clean this the, the album sounds. It doesn't have a very raw, dirty feel like like the classic material. It just sounds very over overproduced, but and not not but not in a, a completely bad way. It's not to the point where I can't listen to it. I can listen to it, but at the same time, I definitely am not gonna at least feel uh, at least completely amazed. It's still surprising for what it is. I, I again I enjoyed it the first couple of times that I've listened to it, but since then. When I'm really in the mood for Deep Purple, it ain't gonna be one of the albums I will go for. But that doesn't mean that this album really didn't belong to be in this list. I think it definitely belonged to be in here. So, there we go. That's here at number 8, Woosh, from Deep Purple. Now, coming here at number 7 is uh, Placebo from Actor, which is uh, the second album of one of Chris Black's uh, other side projects. Uh, and he... Again, besides High Spirits or Dawnbringer, this is definitely uh, one of his more known ones too. But uh, this album, being again uh, the second full-length album uh, under the uh, the actor name, uh, this is not a bad album. Uh, in my uh, review, uh, I definitely stated how compared to High Spirits, this one has more of a rock leaning, almost very popular. What I think of my uh, one of my subscribers. Uh, 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 vinyl transmission. He definitely pointed out like I think he said like it's somewhere between either The cars meets metal or something like that was there or did he say ABBA? <laughs> it's just very much. It's kind of has a very very I would say the best way is if that the cars went metal or played really hard rock and That's kind of the, the the best comparison and it's definitely interesting. It's different, but uh, not 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 to say that that, that this is probably some of uh, Chris Black Black's uh, best material, but it's a fine album. I definitely don't think it's a terrible record to begin with. Uh, but uh, again, I already done a review on this album. I don't need to go into too much depth on this album. So that's here at number seven is Placebo from Actor. Now coming in at number six 
is Origins Volume 2 from Ace Freely, the follow-up to 2016's Origins Volume 1, which is basically Ace Freely going back and covering a lot of uh, his... Uh, Basically, a lot of his influences, the bands or the artists that really inspired him to pick up a guitar in the first place. And you definitely get a lot of cool uh, uh, covers on this album. Uh, again, uh, we got uh, even some guest musicians on here. We got Lita Ford being on his cover of Jumpin' Jack Flash from Rolling Stone. Uh, we got even Cheap Tricks Robin Zander uh, doing, helping with, with the, uh, the cover of Humble Pie's 30 Days in the Hole. We then even have... Uh, Rob Zombie guitar player John Five playing on two of uh, the cover songs on here. One being "I'm Down" from the Beatles and uh, "Politician" from Cream. And uh, the 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 duo, or at least the combination and the twin guitar attack between these two, where they're just turning up guitar solos, is actually fucking cool. I really, I, I definitely enjoy a lot of this. I even like his cover for like a. Uh, for uh, uh, mountains never in my life, I even dig uh, his cover of "Deep Purple Space Truckin." Uh, Manic Depression from uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, the uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders track Kicks, and of course uh, the uh, What We Gotta Get Out of This Place from The Animals, which has been covered by plenty of artists, from uh, Bloor Cult to Alice Cooper. They've done their covers uh, of this song, and now Ace Frehley has done his own version of this. But as a bonus, just like with Origins Volume 1, where he did a Kiss song, here he does one. It's She from Dress to Kill, and Again, uh, this is probably one of those where it's probably so easy for him to do because of he was one of the guys that definitely were a part of this track, even if it wasn't his song that he had wrote because it was originally was a Wicked Lester track, which was Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons' original band before forming Kiss. But uh, he does a fantastic job with this song too. Uh, really, there's just nothing bad on here. I really didn't mind this at all. I think again, what he does uh, with these with these songs. I think he does a great job with a lot of the covers here, so that's all I gotta say here. So that's here at number 6, Origins Volume 2 from Ace Freely. Finally, let's get into the top 5 part of the top 10 rock releases of 2020. So coming here at number 5 is High Tides, Distant Skies from Night, which is, uh, I believe, the third, no, fourth, actually, fourth full-length album from this Swedish uh, rock man who were definitely were a part of the new wave for traditional heavy metal movement But like I said in my review they seem to really went in for more of a contemporary hard rock sound and on this album It's even more contemporary hard rock taking a lot of an uh, inspiration from 70s bands like Black Blur's the cult or UFO and Thin Lizzy and so on that's where you really get the, the best combination and it's really interesting uh, Definitely I like this album compared to at least some of the past the couple of night albums I think this is probably the best one for me since the, the debut self-titled album in 2013. Uh, it's, a, it's a great album, so I don't need to talk too much about this one. I've done a review, so that's here at number 5. Coming in at number 4 is True Bearings from Freeways, the debut full-length album from these guys. Who, and again, follow up to their, uh, I think their EP from last year, I believe, or was it 2018? Still, this is their follow-up to their uh, debut EP, and... Again, these guys are from Canada. I haven't even covered these guys on this channel, but this is a good album, and I really wanted to cover this one. But this is a good, solid, uh, hard rock album. I know that there, there's some uh, 70s or early 80s metal leanings to this one, but it definitely is more so rooted in the 70s hard rock sound. Think more like bands like uh, April Wine, or Moxie, or, uh, or Thin Lizzy. Uh, I mean, Thinley's not, not a Canadian band, they're an Irish band, but I mean, it definitely it's rooted in that sort of 70s hard rock sound. And they do a great job. I really do love songs like Batter and Bruised, and uh, the opening song, which is uh, Eternal Light, Eternal Night. I love Dead Air, which is a great track. Time is No Excuse is definitely the bluesier number, which definitely, again, where I can make a lot of the moxie comparisons and uh, just survival. There's some good songs on here. There's there's really not a bad song on this album. So uh, it's just solid. If you really dig 70s hard rock stuff and you like also the Canadian 70s hard rock bands, uh, definitely to check out Freeways. True Bearings is a good album, so that's here at number four. Coming number three is the newest EP from Blind Horse. It's Soma Plus Lab Sessions, which is their follow-up to uh, 2017's 
uh, Patagonia, and these guys, again, are based out of Brazil, but they, these guys are a solid uh, retro 70s rock band, but they're so good. They definitely do the, the at least that 70s bluesy rock sound justice compared to like a, a, a Van Fleet. Compared to that, uh, compared to some of these other bands that really take it, I think they do a great job. And of course, I'm friends with like Eddie Ashton and Rodrigo Blasquez, the guitar player, who's a great fucking guitar player. I've again, I've talked a lot of this EP. This is just so great. Definitely, you can hear the inspiration from like early Black Sabbath. Uh, Cream and uh, what other bands I think I had made. I'll, you know what? I'll be quite honest. I don't want to go uh, uh, try and waste too much with this. It's a good album. So again, it's worthy of being here at number three. But Soma Plus Slab Sessions from Blind Horse. Finally, uh, coming in at number two. And it's, this is surprising. You would have expected this to be my number one. But my, but my number two pick here is the newest album from ACDC, it's Power Up. And uh, this could have easily been my number one. This album has just, it, this M, it just stays in my head all the freaking time. I mean, compared to, like I, like I stated, compared to a lot of the, uh, the couple of ACDC albums, something about Power Up just ends up bringing back a lot of familiar, but in some ways, the familiarizing almost at times, it's like seeing an old friend. It's just so great to hear at least ACDC sounding a lot like how they did in the past. And it's still, I think that there's some great stuff and um, I don't want to go on too long. It just sounds, to me, it's the most uh, inspired bunch of songs they've put out in a long time. Though, I don't know if we'll ever replace any of the classic ACDC albums, but it, it definitely is belonging in that at least playlist of classic ACDC albums, where at least after you're done listening to all the classics, you want to at least, you got that itch to scratch. Power Up is worthy of, of at least uh, scratching a lot of that itch. It's a good album, but again, what I also have to talk about again, every time I listen to this, it's just so surprising how Phil Rudd sounds on this album. I thought, again, uh, ever since him coming back in 1995 for Ball Breaker, I felt like there was something missing, even though that, uh, those were never bad records. But as far as the way he just sounds and the way he, he just plays on some of the, the, the albums past Ball Breaker, uh, or at least, pa at least since Ball Breaker, I just noticed that there's a level of energy that was missing. And with this album... It's like he must have drank from the Fountain of Youth because of, he hasn't sounded this powerful, this great sounding, not since 1983's Flick of the Switch was the final album Phil Rudd had played on uh, and the since uh, coming back and uh, then 1995 for Ball Breakers. So a big, big year la uh, gap, long gap there. But this is probably, again, his best for performance on the ACD Sam since uh, 1983's Flick of the Switch. Uh, this is just a sod -am. I just love every fucking song on here at this point. I pretty much had said in my review that I thought one of the weaker songs on the sound being Kick You When You're Down. But ever, but since then, as, a, as much as I've been playing this album, that song just has been growing on me. I, there's just, again, some songs end up growing a lot more on me, while some songs either say the same or they might lose a little bit of that appeal. But even, even the weakest song on here is still better than any of the, the filler stuff on the past couple of ACDC albums. And that, that's just the way I've been feeling toward this album. So, uh, Power Up from ACDC, just a great album from these guys. Uh, they definitely, and uh, Brian Johnson, he hasn't sounded this great on an ACDC album, not since uh, 1990s with the Razor's Edge. Just good. So that's here at number two. But what is my number one? Let's find out. So, if this album right here, Power Up from ACDC, wasn't my number one, what is? my number one bet or favorite rock album of 2020 well since i pretty much mentioned uh, this band earlier in my video and since some of you were definitely were waiting for this album well it shouldn't be any guess at this point because if you did have any guess you would have guessed correct you would have won a gold medal you would have won a cookie 
Here at number one is the year-long comeback album from these guys. But the symbol remains from Blue Oyster Cult. The thing with ACDC is that while it's great that they were able to put out one good, another you know, pretty good album. Uh, again, they were able to at least release a good album that I definitely can at least enjoy. But the thing is, they at least at least kept going. They still were at least a well-oiled machine. They definitely, again, they were a, still a very hard-working band. But Blur Cult, on the other hand, well, they hadn't been releasing in any albums. ACDC at least were able to release quite a bit of albums since uh, the two th since 2000. These guys haven't been. They haven't released a album since 2001's uh, Curse of the Hidden Mirror. So the wait 19 years to have them to follow up to such an a to at least the Curse of the Hidden Mirror, which was not a bad album, but it wasn't their best. But here they come back with here in 2020 with the symbol remains and and release an album that's actually very enjoyable. I mean, we got about 14 songs on here, and it pretty much almost goes to at least 50, uh, at least around a little over 50 minutes. But the thing is, it's enjoyable. I can at least pick out some pretty good songs on here. I mean, that was me. Uh, even I've come to really uh, break into at least uh, Tainted Blood, uh, Nightmare Epiphany, Edge of the World. Uh, Train True Lenny's song, The Return of Saint Cecilia, which is a hard rocker. Uh, Stand Up and Fight, Florida Man, The Alchemist, Secret Road, There's a Crime and Fight. There's still plenty of really good songs on this album. And Curse of the Hidden Mirror only had one or two or three decent songs. This one's got more better songs compared to The Curse of the Hidden Mirror. It, 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 it's just great. And the new guy... Uh, Richie uh, Castellano and the songs he sings on uh, being uh, Tainted Blood, The Machine, and The Return of Saint Cecilia are fine songs uh, with me uh, really uh, really enjoying the, uh, the most out of Tainted Blood and The Return of Saint Cecilia. But there's just so many. Even uh, the, uh, the stuff that uh, Eric Bloom and uh, uh, Buck Dharma sing on these songs. Uh, there's just there, there's just good stuff on here. I cannot complain. I've talked a lot about this album. I don't need to go into too much depth. They just made a much more enjoyable album. Uh, though, again, these guys did too. But you only can pick one. And this is the band that I chose. I chose The Symbol Remains from Lords to Cult. So there you go. There is my top 10 rock releases of 2020. If you have any thoughts on any of these albums or releases that I showed in this video or at least talked about, uh, definitely leave them in the comments section below. But if there's any albums here you haven't even heard, you know what to do. You, since I've talked pretty good about some of these uh, albums anyways, you know which ones you should probably be going out to check out. So with that, I hope y'all enjoyed. Uh, this is for Thrasher. I say I'm out. I'll see y'all again real soon. Because I'll be back here with the, at least on Wednesday, with the top 10 new wave, a traditional heavy metal albums of 2020. But tomorrow, there'll be a Unearthed Mail episode. And it probably could be the final Unearthed uh, Mail episode of this year. So with that, take care everyone.